So could you give a warm welcome of applause to Stefan Greinke, who will be talking to you in one minute. So, hi everybody. Um, my name is Stefan Grünke. Um, I'm a software developer since about 15 years, uh, working in sole projects and larger teams and smaller teams. So, um, mostly my development stack was JavaScript. Uh, and uh, you will find some of the tools that I mentioned coming from this world, uh, but I'm very sure you can uh, also find something for your project uh, that uh, applies here. Um, here's my email address, my PGP key, and uh, my favorite social network account. <laughs> Um, yeah, so a little spoiler what will happen today. Um, I will um, talk about development process exploitation. So that means if you are developing uh, your software and somebody joins your team and sends you code for re review, uh, it could happen uh, that it executes code on your machine uh, without your knowledge. Um, there are a few things that are really hard to catch uh, or I find hard, hard to catch and I want to share. Uh, maybe you have the same problems and you, uh, you find that the, the same mitigations apply for your project as well. Um, yeah, I will then continue and um, let's start with the software development process. Um, that's a small cycle. So first of all, it starts with an operating system. You need to have a computer to write the software uh, and that's something you need to trust first off. Um, if you... Um, nope. Yes, so your operating system uh, contains keys and credentials. It contains the source code you want to develop and your tools that you have in place. And the major risk uh, is that the tools are vulnerable uh, to some exploitation uh, or that your host is already compromised and you write the software uh, committed to your uh, coworkers and it isn't what you intended to write. Um, that's a larger problem here. Um, after you... Uh, start writing code, the editor is kind of the interface that I have to write the files uh, and edit the code. I find it kind of complex uh, to, use a, uh, to use an editor. Uh, on the left you can see that many of the editors come with a package manager included, uh, which is a good sign for the complexity that these tools have. And um, I don't know what tools you need, um, but they support you in development, so it's very good to, for example, have code linters and auto-completion in place uh, to write better code. Uh, at the same uh, time, it can be a problem, um, yeah, because they can execute code unattendedly. We will see in a moment. Um, the mitigation I came up with uh, for the editor part is that you have a virtualized environment where you run your editor, so when something happens and, uh, and it is compromised, not your root system is also compromised as well. Uh, you want to monitor all your config files that you have in the project and you want to get awareness uh, what what exactly happens on my system when I run and view this code. Yeah. Um, the next part you will probably use is a shell integration. So as soon as you open your repository, some of the shells I saw uh, just tell you what branch you're working in, what files were changed and so on. So that's something that comes very neat if you're developing, uh, but it can be a risk as well. Um, yeah. So my opinion on the, on the shell integrations is mostly that it's made for software development on your own system. So when you write the code and you can trust it, it's not a problem to use these tools at all. But as soon as you get uh, sources from uh, foreign developers, um, it can be, can be a problem. So um, choose your tools wisely and uh, don't uh, execute code from others <laughs> if possible. Uh, the, versioning, the versioning system uh, that you commit your code to is also a very good choice. Um, for example, um, Git and um, yeah, Git can execute hooks uh, on different occasions. For example, when you check out new code, if you commit uh, and so on. That means if you um, manage to clone a repository and a Git folder is included or a HG folder is included, uh, it could mean that your operating system decides to uh, execute whatever is in the hooks. It's not possible to store a .git folder within a git repository, but it's possible to store it in a mercurial repository or in a SVN or something, and then your shell integration won't know um, what the original source was and will execute it anyway. Um, one thing that was introduced, for example, from Visual Studio Code um, yeah, this October is that they now support git hooks, which is a great feature, right? <laughs> 
Um, the mitigations against this are pretty easy. Uh, you can either set a different hooks path, which is um, not within this project repository so that you don't execute Git hooks at all, uh, or you can use that little wrapper here uh, that you see to, for example, check at least that there is no file that is a Git hook in within that folder before you execute Git. It's a very good choice if you want to protect yourself from, uh, from that vulnerability. Um, so, after you committed the code and shared it to the versioning server, um, you probably are going to build it automatically. So some services like Travis CI uh, will run it, <coughs> will run it for you. Uh, so they will run tests, they will compile the software, and also they do the package, uh, package versioning and deployment to some other places. Um, it becomes a problem if you can't reproduce the results from your um, from your build runner because it's an it's a system you don't control sometimes, and uh, as soon as you uh, get the binary result from it, uh, if you compile the software that compiles to binary, uh, you need to check that result somehow because somebody could have uh, altered it without your knowledge and then you will ship it to your users. Um, also a problem on many of these build workers is you want to have this process very fast. So that means you don't want to wait until all the dependencies are installed and a great service is that you have caching in between these projects. Uh, this means that, for example, if somebody managed to uh, inject the version to the cache uh, of some uh, CI system, uh, then it will eventually show up in other projects as well, and uh, you can pivot acro across the projects. Um, usually, if you have a built environment, uh, it has access to some kind of development key. Mostly, if you get pull requests from externals, uh, the keys are stored encrypted and you don't have access to them. But as soon as somebody has right access to your repository, uh, also the keys uh, could be leaked. Let's make an example. You have somebody authoring your software and you don't give permission to edit the master branch of the repository, um, but as soon as you open a, open a branch anywhere and make a pull request, uh, Travis CI or other build runners uh, will use that and decrypt the passwords for you and give you access to the credentials, which you can then print or do whatever you, you intend to. Um, yeah, and for me, the best option here would be to have reproducible builds because then you can use different um, of, the travel, uh, of the build workers and compare the results somehow so that you see if one gets compromised, the other two will tell you, hey, uh, that's a different result, uh, have a look, please. That would be great. Um, and also, the build steps, uh, I mentioned building, testing, and packaging the software, uh, are totally different steps. So what you can do is you can have one compartment per, per step so that you can have it at a, at a final level um, and see what happens here. Mm, after you compile the software, you build the software, uh, you need to ship it to the user somehow. So either you store it in your own server, or uh, most often you use a CDN, you just put it there, and it's an asset that's, that's lying around. Your users will come around, download it from here, and execute it. So uh, what is the problem here? Uh, the problem is that if you have a URL, it's very hard to prove that it's actually from the, from the real maintainer. If you call your software like a diff uh, if you call your uh, account like a different project, then people won't be able to, to notice the difference somehow. What you can do uh, to mitigate this is to publish the URLs that you're allegedly using um, and also sign your assets so that users can check is that something that the developer intended to give me or is it something uh, that, is really, uh, that is really not intended. So... Um, Yes, um, and the next part is you need to reach out to your users. So you make, uh, make people aware that there is a project they can check out, um, they can clone, and uh, usually you have the package registries. Uh, a few slides back, you saw that the package um, managers are also included in the editors. So um, that's also something uh, where you can ship the software. Um, but the package managers I was mostly looking at was, for example, NPM. Uh, there was an interesting occasion where somebody had a project called Kick. Um, the company Kick uh, then tried to take it down, and the person just ignored it for the moment. Um, but then Kick reached out to NPM directly, and they deleted the repository. Um, in consequence, the developer removed all his projects uh, from the versioning server, and a few hours later, malware showed up with the same uh, project names. So that means if you have a software that uses that dependencies and uh, somebody freed up the names, uh, it would affect your repository as well and compromise it. Mm, that's something uh, that needs mitigation. I think the best idea here is to uh, not only identify the projects by, by a unique identifier, but also have a GUID or, an, um, or a unique identifier per project um, that does not change, so that you can make a difference. 
Uh, that's something that's up to the package registries uh, to implement. Um, that's not something we can do as a user, but it's a very common case to. Um, it's a very common case that these packages uh, fluctuate. So for example, if somebody deletes it, you don't have a backup of that. A very good idea is also to store offline backups of every package that you check out and that you install to your software, because it's it's very bad if you um, want to maintain your software and you figure out there's something uh, there's something missing and you can't recover because it's deleted. Um, Yes, um, software developers have some needs uh, during their work. Um, I want my tooling to perform. Um, if my code editor, for example, is in a VM and the VM is slow, that's something that's annoying uh, all over the process. So um, then on the other hand, um, the velocity is something that your manager will require from you if you write commercial software or uh, you, you try to get something done um, and you you can't spend all day to work on chores and improve your repository, diversioning, and so on. So that's something uh, you need to deal with. Um, another big factor for me is the re uh, reliability. So as soon as your software goes down and you are in holiday or something, um, anybody else from the company or uh, from your team should be able to recover uh, what was there before, um, also known as the bus factor. Um, and yeah, if you have convenience, like for example, Ruby on Rails gives you, it's, um, it gives you a very good, um, very easy start in the project, and that's something you don't want to break uh, by making it too complicated with a development environment. Um, and also something I found uh, to be more annoying than, uh, um, than helpful is if you want to pair program and you have a very compartmentized uh, environment, it's very hard to share the resources that you need to talk about uh, with other developers. Expecting you're not in the same room but working remotely, what is for me most often the case. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, a large problem that I saw is if you underhand somebody code. Um, if you go ahead and um, and check out code from uh, any online resources, it's um, sometimes very hard to tell if the code that you see in your, for example, Git diff. Uh, is what you really would expect to see. Um, I have some examples here uh, which can show how this could work and how this could look like if, you, if somebody tries to inject code to your repository that you don't see. Uh, first of all, let's start with uh, something easy that's phishing. Um, what you see here on the slide, um, on, the, on the left side, maybe you see the cursor, uh, that's not a full path, that is just the domain name. The slashes in here are U uh, UTF-8 characters, um, so that that thing here resolves to a host name. And if you con uh, control this host, you can get a certificate for it. Um, and in the example below, you see how it would look like if you install it. First, I um, have a host that's just running a web server on port 80 so that you can see the result. Um, OK, I was cheating a little bit. I was putting the, um, the domain in the etc host so that I don't, don't have to buy it for just showing it. It's strange that .zip is a domain, actually. Um, but then if you install it, uh, you would see that, uh, yeah, you can, you can send somebody a very nice looking link, which looks like a totally different project, uh, but it's pointing to your server instead. And um, I found many of the package managers uh, having the nice feature of executing PostScript hooks. Uh, so that means if you have installed it, uh, it will run some commands afterwards for you. Uh, yeah. So then, um, there is invisible code. If you go online somewhere, find in a forum or uh, in a blog, you find uh, an article and see, hey, that, that code is actually solving my problem. You go ahead and copy paste it. So on the left, you see the source code, how this would look like um, in HTML for the blog. On the, on the right, there's the result. So you can go ahead, you can copy paste from it. And if you paste it to a text area, you will see that the result is something that you didn't expect. Uh, for example, if you copy a large chunk of code, you won't go ahead and review it uh, on your local system again, and that could be uh, the compromise for your project. So, um, oh. there we go. Another example uh, here is you can uh, use ASCII characters, uh, the control characters, to influence the output in your terminal. So if your terminal also supports the legacy uh, of ASCII control characters, you can use that to just revert the line and uh, override it with something you wouldn't expect. What you see uh, on top here, that harmless script is the file. It's a little larger than you would expect for just the echo foo, but um, not something you would notice when you just see it. Um, Looking at it from a hex editor, you can see that there is something more going on than just the foo. 
Uh, and if you actually execute it, it will not print something. It will create a pwned text, uh, which is a good example for you that, you uh, that your host was compromised in this moment. Mm. Another example I found online, so uh, credit to Ariel um, for this. So there is a byte sequence you can use so that this even works in a Git diff. So when you're working exclusively in your terminal and you're not doing reviews on, on GitHub or some graphical tool, um, it could be the case that you don't notice what was going on. Uh, what you can see here on the left is I created an empty repository. I um, added a small script. And um, in the next step down here, I added some improvement to the script, uh, which is actually the malicious commit that's here in red. Uh, afterwards, uh, I just run a git diff on the code, and I see that there is only no backdoor. Oh, sorry, that should be OK in the uh, updated slides. Um, so you don't see the evil.sh that it's executed as well if you run it. It's something I consider very dangerous. Yeah. So, uh, some mitigations. Um, the best thing you can do uh, is to make it expensive for your attackers to, uh, to compromise or try to. So as soon as you have the chance to notice what is going on, uh, also retrospectively, uh, you can at least uh, burn the capabilities and um, tell others how your project was attempted to compromise. Um, and that's something that is, in my opinion, the best mitigation against this complexity. Um, what you can also do is you can uh, test your software from external services directly, which will tell you if some compromise happened. Um, for example, Git has, an, has a new, newly introduced, uh, they will check your packages, um, the dependencies, and will warn you about some vulnerabilities that are commonly known. Um, the, best um, the best thing you can do on your local system is to build small compartments so that if some compromise happens, it doesn't affect your full host. Also, not all your projects. Um, uh, that you have access to. And it's very important that you have backups on a different system than the host you're working on. Um, so if the compromise happens, uh, you still have access to the original data and can compare it and do some forensics on this. Um, yeah, so the intrusion detection and forensics. Um, there are some great tools available. Um, for example, my favorites are Dtrace and OpenSnoop. Uh, you can monitor uh, changes and access on the file system or on your system at all. And you can, for example, set some rules for your projects that are specifically matching. So I, I'm not going to share some rules that match for all projects, um, but you, you will figure out what is, what is, for example, important. Very good start is, for example, to open Snoop for ETC Pass BD. Um, if there was some access, then you can, for example, say that's not something my, so my software would do. Um, <laughs> And again, it's very important to have the, have the backups of this, because in the moment where you execute it, you can't trust your host at all. Um, the, the idea how to achieve this is if you have a VM per project, for example, you let it run for half a year, you don't approve the situation. Instead of having one system that you need to update the software to, uh, you need to update uh, afterwards all the projects that you're working on um, frequently, and that's something that's easy to forget, so it's dangerous. If you assume that every time you run some command or every time you work in a project, you spin up a new server entirely from scratch, install the dependencies and so on, that's something um, that's not a risk for you. Um, also, if you have, for example, a virtualized uh, server environment, you can have memory dumps at, all the, uh, at any time. You can monitor the network, and you can also uh, diff the file system. For example, if you stop the server and just compare it to a previous version and see, hey, here's something that was changed that I uh, didn't plan. It's great to know. Yeah, um, very important is also to separate your accounts. For example, if you see large GitHub accounts, uh, people are making contributions every day since years. Um, so it shows that the people have access to very um, to many projects from the same machine. So, and the, the permission model from GitHub, for example, allows you to store an SSH key for write access, but uh, it automatically has access to all the repositories you control. So the best idea you can have here is to make a project, uh, to make a new GitHub account for, or to make a new account on that uh, versioning system that only has exclusively write access to that single repository. Um, so when you work in your compartment system, and you uh, want to upload or pull changes, uh, you don't, you can't influence other repositories. That means a compromise doesn't spread across all your projects and so on, um, which would be an invitation for malware um, somehow or ransomware. 
and uh, you get a better permission model if you um, create a GitHub organization. Uh, in this case, you can also limit your, your own access in a better way. So my recommendation is not to work in your uh, personal GitHub account, uh, but create an organization for your project. So, uh, something many projects are missing are to find um, responsible persons for security for, um, um, and to clearly communicate um, what, is the, what is the plan for, um, for incident response. Um, small example, if you uh, have a new project and you find a vulnerability, you would like to commit it, um, but you don't open an issue publicly because then everybody, every user would be affected. You try to reach out to some developers, and if you don't have any clue how to securely, how to securely uh, achieve this, um, that can get you into trouble. Um, and there are uh, quite a few projects which don't communicate this, and uh, some of them don't even respond to their security at email address, which is bad. Okay, and in this case, uh, I told you what I saw from uh, from my experiences working on the projects. So um, that's basically my uh, summary of uh, what can be what can be harmful and what can be good for your project. Thank you, and we now have time for Q&A. In the room, you can line up behind the microphones, and I can see we have a question from the internet already. What about Git signed comments? Any thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, so as soon as you have signed comments, and I find that you also email with the same PGP key, uh, it's very interesting that you have the PGP key on the same host probably, uh, then you have your Git executable. So if somebody executes Git hooks, uh, they can steal your PGP keys from this. Um, I didn't find any tutorial online which explains you how to make it manually so that you don't use the uh, Git for signing the commits. But I think it's, it, it can be very good to sign the commits, um, but it can be also dangerous um, because your email, um, your email communication can be compromised. Microphone number four. In the Git dev you showed us, there were some, some control com uh, characters. I think Git diff pipes to less by default, so shouldn't they appear there somewhere? No, they don't. I just uh, checked with the latest version today. so. That's something that, that well, uh, we can also click on the blog and see if there is the video available. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's very hard to show from, uh, from my HTML slide how this works, so this video animation, maybe you can touch it a bit. That's how it would work. So most often, yes, uh, if you pipe to less or you use a hex editor to review, uh, then you would notice, yes, so. I somehow remember that and maybe it only shows for longer divs, but I think when I type git div, I can scroll around. Ah, that, that's interesting, okay. Uh, I need to try. We have a question from microphone number one. Um, you mentioned um, Travis having access to um, hidden variables and um, you being able to leak those uh, variables during pull requests. Uh, what are your suggestions to mitigate that? Um, don't give people right access to your repository, uh, not even to branches um, that you don't trust. So as soon as they have right access, they would also know the, the secrets behind the variables in this case. I like the security model because uh, if you, for example, get contributions from outside, nobody can trigger that uh, and steal your keys. But as soon as you build it on your own branch uh, somewhere in the repository, that changes. Uh, yes, but uh, if you submit a pull request, you don't necessarily have to have um, right access to that repository. Yes, that's what I mean. Uh, if you come from outside and it's not within the same repository, the, the uh, secrets are not decrypted, so you can't run the steps. For example, you, do, you would not like to deploy directly from a, from a foreign branch somewhere. We have a question from microphone number four. 
Um, you mentioned the problem of with uh, different compartments and how to exchange those um, environments with other people. I think that problem has already been solved with Vagrant and, and some kind of provisioning software like Ansible. Um, do you have any experience with uh, checking those results of those uh, Vagrant boxes that are automatically provisioned, like having some, some service spec software to, to check those environments afterwards, or having some kind of hashing and how to find out if, if they have been reproduced the same way and, or if there have been any exploit used to, in that process of um, setting up the, the Vagrant uh, environments? Yeah, so different levels you can look at this. Um, there was, let me try to find it. Yes, um, you can, for example, memory dump at any time if you have the host drying somewhere. Uh, or was your question exactly that you uh, want to check if your environment that was spawned up uh, was not compromised yet? Yeah, there, there has to be some, some kind of process uh, how to verify that the um, produced environments are um, the ones you expect them to be, or if they have been compromised. And the problem is, um, I, I've used those um, environments and uh, tried first. I tried the um, full disk encryption for the Vagrant boxes, but um, the problem is, uh, it's always the same um, um, uh, synchron, uh, the same um, key for the for, for the encryption. So that doesn't work. And even as you mentioned, you can have a memory dump, so you can read out that key. So there's no real. A possibility to, to set up an, uh, um, a varying box that can't be um, tampered with afterwards. So there have to be, has to be some kind of um, hash sum to, to compare those um, produced uh, results. Yeah, so as soon as you have a reproducible build and the result uh, that you have, for example, script languages are man, uh, much easier to achieve because then you can just diff the file system uh, directory and uh, see if there was some change. What I would do in, uh, in this case is to run uh, multiple services and compare the results if that's possible. For example, you have those reproducible builds, then uh, run it on a few servers which are independent um, and compare what you have. We have two more questions from microphone number one and only a few minutes left. Microphone number one. So what's your recommendation for handling credentials in application configuration files? We need often some database, user and password, or something like this in, say, Spring Boot application, uh, YML, or things like that. And uh, is there any best practice or any uh, framework which can handle such things? Or uh, we need to uh, explicitly encrypt uh, these credentials in this application and then decrypt uh, for itself in the application, but then you need uh, the symmetric keys or? Yeah, so Ansible, for example, comes with a mechanism that's called Ansible Vault, which encrypts that with a, with a passphrase that you can enter in your command line as soon as you touch the, touch the file. For example, if you want to run Ansible, then it will ask you for the password when starting up. So if you want to share that password with your developers, everybody has access to the same keys. I would prefer to give everybody, uh, so every person in this team or even every device, a different key, if that's possible somehow. Um, that's what I was trying to mention with um, the GitHub accounts, that you don't use one GitHub account, but you use many of them. Um, if you, yeah. We have one more question from microphone number one, and then a question from the internet. Um, yeah, my question was more about, I mean, some of the, your recommendations are low-hanging fruits, but some of them, it's like, it's just impossible. And I mean, it's not sustainable, like, it's very hard to maintain. And so I'm wondering if you use all of them every day, or just part of them, or do you just leave, like, an open DSD developer at the end? It, it depends on the project. So what I try to do on my development system is to have this compartment so that one compromised uh, project would not affect others, because... Um, I'm not the only person checking uh, and merging the code, so um, and that's something that gets quickly too much for one person to review. So uh, I I can't review all the code that I'm running currently on my computer. That's true, um, but I can try to mitigate uh, what the impact of this will be. And the question from the internet: What tool would you recommend for diffing a file system? Diff. Um, <laughs> worked for me so uh, so far or what, what exactly is the question about um, maybe uh, you want to see if there did the hash change in the files so when you have for example the script file 1 and the script file B and they have a different hash sum uh, that's something uh, I would consider um, something I would look up manually so as soon as I have an indication that there was something wrong I would look it up manually and use any tool that I, that I have hexedit or whatever's available 
Good. We have less than one minute left. Any final remarks? Mm, thank you. Thank you very much.